Of course, the reason why they were getting closer and closer was to have a better look, because in Taliban-ruled Afghanistan, no man saw another woman's face unless she was a mother, a sister, or a daughter, or a close female relative. So seeing me would be a bit like seeing a panda in the zoo for the first time. So they were getting closer. Of course, I'm thinking they're getting closer so they can take aim when the stoning starts. I mean, we can laugh about it now, but I really thought that the final minutes of my life were being played out in this godforsaken area. And as I looked around, they say that your life flashes before you. Mine didn't. I'm just thinking, how can I get out of this situation? And then I remembered my time as a Sunday school teacher. And there was a biblical scene where Jesus had said at a stoning, let him without sin cast the first stone. So I thought, right, I'm going to say that. <laughs> of course, it never occurred to me they wouldn't be able to understand me. But I thought, no, I'm going to say, okay then, bring it on, but let him without sin cast the first stone. And so I'm playing this out in my mind and then I'm looking round and I thought, no, there's probably some pious so-and-so at the back saying, that's me, and he'll start the stoning. So all of this is going through my mind when suddenly the Taliban soldier returns and he has with him a woman wearing a burqa. She comes up behind me and turns me around very briskly and starts to frisk me. And I thought, oh, they're not going to kill me. Well, not just yet anyway. They're trying to find out if I'm carrying any weapons. And isn't it strange that he's gone off to get a woman? You know, why wouldn't he just search me himself? Obviously showing more courtesy than British police. And so all the fear that I had felt and the terror just melted away with relief. And then I became very angry. Those men had made me feel as though I was going to die. So I pulled away from the Afghan woman and I swung round at these wretched men. And I was wearing, I want you to picture the scene, my burqa had gone, but I was wearing a shalwa kameez, um, the trousers and an orange dress down to the knees. And I swung round at these men, very angry, and I said, I am not carrying any weapons. And to emphasize this, I picked up the hem of my dress and said, look. <laughs> well, there was a collective sharp intake of breath. And then they all turned round and ran as though the devil was snapping at their heels. I don't know if any of you have seen the Carry On film where the Scottish regiment lift up their kilts at the natives and they run off, but it was the same effect. Of course, this was highly inappropriate behavior for a woman in Afghanistan, as I was to find out. And the lady wearing the burqa swung me back round and whacked me across the face. She was in such a state of shock at this vulgar display. Anyway, having established that I'm not carrying any weapons, I was then bundled back into the car and driven off to Jalalabad. I was taken into the intelligence headquarters and introduced to the head of intelligence, who understood a little bit of English. I apologized for causing any inconvenience, and he asked me to write down my personal details and telephone contacts to prove that I was a journalist. After I had done that, he said, we are about to eat. You must have something to eat. And I said, well, that's very kind, but I need to use the telephone first. And he said, no, you can't use the phone. So I said, in that case, I won't eat either as a guest or a prisoner of the Taliban until I can use the phone. And what started then was the war of attrition, which was to last 10 days. Now, you would think that the most evil, brutal regime in the world 
couldn't care less if one of their prisoners had gone on hunger strike. But these men were very, very upset. Despite my protest saying I'm not eating, every morning, noon and night, they would bring me food. They would lay out a cloth on the floor, a beautiful carpeted floor, by the way, and uh, they would put down some bread, some stew, and um, some rice, and they would bring in a jug of water and a bowl, and they would wash my hands, and they would tell me in broken English, you are our sister, you are our guest, we want you to be happy. And I thought, what sort of evil, brutal regime is this? Don't they understand the job description? And I'm thinking, you know, this is just a trick. They're trying to soften me up. And then the really bad guys will come in with the electrodes. In fact, isn't it strange? Everything that I thought would have happened to me under this so-called savage primitive regime happened to um, prisoners in Abu Ghraib, in Guantanamo Bay, and other US holding facilities, which always prompts me to say, thank God I was captured by the most evil, brutal regime in the world and not by the Americans. <laughs> by the third day, they called the doctor, not that I was feeling unwell at all, but they called the doctor and he came, a little man who trained in Germany, and he looked in my eyes, my ear, took my pulse, looked in my mouth, and I thought, they do this, don't they, on death row in Texas just before they're going to execute somebody. They like to make sure that they're fit and healthy. And then he took my blood pressure. And something bothered him because he then took it again. And I said, yes, I know I have high blood pressure. And he said, no, you don't. Your blood pressure is normal. I said, don't be so ridiculous. It can't be normal. You know, I'm about to be killed by the Taliban. How on earth is my blood pressure normal? And he said, look, and he did it again. And it was normal. I said, there you are, three days with the Taliban and you've cured my blood pressure, thank you very much. <laughs> On the fifth day, there was a little guy called Hamid, the doctor's son actually, who acted as the translator and he came running into my room very, very excited. He said, you are on the front page of the papers and he brought in the weekly paper from Jalalabad. And although photographs were banned under the Taliban, there were two pictures of me from Reuters on the front page with a little story and headlines that took over half the page. The headlines looked longer than the story. And I said, what does the headline say? And he read it out and he said, it says, the Taliban has cured Yvonne Ridley's blood pressure and she's very happy. Not the catchiest of headlines. <laughs> During those six days in Jalalabad, a procession of very scary, fierce-looking men came into the room and through Hamid asked me questions and the interrogations would go on and on until maybe eight, nine o'clock at night. They never physically threatened me. The worst thing that they said to me was, if you don't tell us the truth, you will be here for 20 years. I assured them that they would get sick long before I did. And I had um, decided on quite a risky strategy, really. I had decided to be the prisoner from hell. I had bought into the propaganda, you see, that this was the most evil, brutal regime in the world and it didn't matter what I said or did, they were going to kill me at the end of the day when they wanted to. 
And so I just thought, if I'm nice, they're going to kill me. If I'm nasty, they're going to kill me. Well, I'm just going to go down fighting. And so I was very abusive and aggressive. And the harder I pushed them, the nicer they were.